Hey guys, good morning. It's Guido coming at you with a, a Coffee Talk interview and a special guest, Jimmy here. For, uh, Jimmy Crib from used to be Drinking Brothers, but you've rebranded. And what is it now? Uh, now it's Jimmy and Nubs. Jimmy and Nubs. So Jimmy is uh, just back from, where did you just get back from? We were just chatting a little bit about that a moment ago. Uh, I got back from Syria about two days before Christmas. Uh, spent about eight months there uh, supporting Army Special Forces. Glad to be home? Very. <laughs> <laughs> got the beard going on, though. I like that. I like that. Yeah, it was, uh, I've kind of like this is it was a nice thing was for about eight months. I didn't for the first time in my career, I didn't have to shave. So it was uh, it was nice. I got to grow it out and see how I actually like having facial hair. Oh, so, while, uh, so while you were there, you got to grow it out. Oh yeah, I had I had a beard down to my chest. It was great. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, he was uh working with some of the special operators out there and uh, we'll chat about some of that and he'll tell us as much as he can without uh getting himself in trouble, which is always a good thing. Currently active duty army, is that correct? Yes, I'm still in. And an EOD specialist. Yep, I got about another 3 years before I'm finished. So before we get to tanks, tell everybody what the, in case you don't know in case they don't know, tell everybody what an EOD specialist does, because this is pretty, this is pretty amazing crap. What you guys do? All right, so explosive ordnance disposal, and I should have this spiel down pretty good because I taught it for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, so explosive ordnance disposal specializes in reduction of explosive hazards on the battlefield. Um, we talk, we work through uh, grenades, rockets, landmines, missiles, bombs, uh, nuclear ordnance, biological, chemical weapons. Um, all the way through, even through explosive or explosive, geez, improvised explosive devices, which has kind of been our specialty for the last, well, since the, the war started, really. Um, so that's that's been my job for the last 13 odd years. Do you guys count? Do you count saves, or or do you have a do you have a term for how many bombs you've you've uh, neutralized? Do you, do you do any kind of metrics like that for each of you? No, because tracking is kind of, I'm, I'm sure somewhere there might be a way to do it, but like per person, they don't really get down to it. Like they'll, they'll track it by typically by company and team, but it's only really matters for as long as you're on the team. Right. Um, so for me, I don't, I don't know. I have no clue how many I've done. It's well over a hundred and something. Now, yeah, th these are sensitive questions because, you know, I'm sure you know friends who have had issues, but uh, without getting into gory details, have you scared the hell out of yourself yet? Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> there was uh, a couple of times. 20, 2012 was some of the scarier ones. It was uh, a one time that I was working on an IED, and uh, I was I had to be down on my hands and knees for it because we didn't have really the tools for anything else. And I was trying to find this pressure plate, and then I realized it was I had just put my hand on it, but I oh. had, thankfully couldn't put enough weight on it. Uh, but the other good luck was there was no battery attached to it, so I <laughs> I got lucky that day. That's actually interesting. Do you do you count a little bit on the buffoonery of the guys who are building them? Have you run into some shoddy work that just was never going to work, and you were relieved when you found that? Yes and no. So, like having shoddy work, sometimes like you'll have the guy who doesn't either he's being forced to put it in or he doesn't really want to. He just kind of wants the money, and he'll just go out and just kind of throw it in there. And then sometimes you have the guy who wants to kill people, but he's really bad at it. <laughs> And then his stuff's a little bit more dangerous because you don't know if it's going to work the way that he wants it to or if it's just going to work whenever it wants to. And wow. that's uh, that's a little scarier. Yeah, yeah, I can see. I Definitely, holy cow. I mean, the, the Hollywood version of this is kind of all over the place. There was a movie. The Hurt Locker, is that was that what the movie was? Yeah, The Hurt Locker. The Hurt Locker, yeah. How close was it? Uh, the, the, it, it it's a meme like every other <laughs> like every right. other jobs movie i mean right. how many memes do you have about top gun exactly that, that's what i was going to say it's, it has to be probably in the same in the same area as that i always tell people when they ask me questions about that i'm like you know it's it's both more amazing than that movie and more boring than that movie mm -hmm. you know what i mean that, that there's actually some of each of those things in there well welcome back uh from from out there and i know you said you were glad to be home um, so we're, we're both community contributors for tanks and now having to get a little bit of information about your background. Now I'm fascinated about what brought you to gaming, streaming world of tanks. Like how did, how did you get here? What, what was that path? Uh, I, well, I've always been a big nerd. I was, I was the kid in the barracks that was playing video games all day, uh, when I was younger, but I kind of got here because, uh, 
well, actually, I can thank one of my platoon sergeants. Like, I started, he got me playing World of Tanks literally while we were in Afghanistan in 2014. Uh, he was playing it on our, our crappy internet connection that we had with like 300 and something ping to the NA server. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, it, it, the first couple of times I walked by, I was like, what is this nerdy game you're playing? What is this crap? Like, Was that off I a satellite it? connection? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Been there. Been there. And he was, I was sitting there watching. I was like, dude, this, this, what is this? This is dumb. And then a couple <laughs> more times I walked by, I was like, all right, tell me about this game. And then like a couple days later, I was like, all right, I want to play this game. Let's play it. <laughs> and so I had... And uh, it was like, all right, it's cool, but I really didn't have a passion for it yet. And then, like, I came home and I was playing more World of Tanks, and I was like, I kind of want to try this out some more. Like, I want to try and stream more because I've always been a tech geek. If you look around my room, I've got sound mixers and cameras and stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, I was like, well, let's let's do some more with it. So I started just streaming a little more and a little more, and I shoot, I think I've been streaming almost six years now. Okay, so you've been at that for a while then. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's, you know, varying degrees of success. And so as like as time goes on, has gone on, I've kind of found my uh, stride a little bit more. Yeah. So I know what I like and I know what I want to make. And so that's that's been something that I've been going for. So that's that's kind of how I got to streaming World of Tanks. Like I've been playing World of Tanks since 2014 now. And my interest in the game has gone down a little over time. But it hasn't gone away, so it's something that's like I always enjoy coming back and playing the game. It's not I, I'm not somebody I'm I'm, for lack of a better term, filthy casual. I I can't sit and play it you know eight hours a day or six hours a day. Typically, I'm playing maybe ten hours a week or less. Maybe right. I play it twice a week for a couple hours. What did you uh, What did you play before, before you came to World of Tanks? Were you a FPS guy? Were you a RPG guy? RTS? What were you, What were you into? I was an FPS guy. I played a lot of Battlefield. Um, right. I was real, real and in, big into Battlefield Three. I like Battlefield. Well, I like some of Battlefield Four, um, and before that, I was big into Call of Duty. Um, so, like back back when I used to play on console, the first game that really kind of hooked me for hours and hours at a time was uh, Battlefield Two when it came to console. And I've just played the crap out of that all the time. What's the percentage uh, of guys that that you work with that play FPS games? Do you think that are that are active with you? Uh, I mean, if they play video games, most of them probably play FPS. Yeah. It's, it's, there's the very small sliver that are the sports players that are probably playing Madden, but pretty much everybody plays FPS because when we're overseas, uh, I mean, that's that's what we have to do. My first couple deployments, that was that was kind of the thing, is everybody had an Xbox. You made sure you brought Halo with you overseas so that we could run the LAN cables and we'd all be playing right. Halo in different parts of the compound. Yeah, a little LAN party within wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did that too. We did that too. Do you... You know, this is something I, I work on a bit with the, the company that I started. It's a side gig I'm doing with training and stuff. Do, do you think there's any utility to FPS and training for, for the Army? And I'm not saying you're going to turn a guy into the, the world's greatest killer because he played a game. But do, do you think there's some, some concepts and ideas that they sort of learn or get strengthened when they play the game? Or do you think it's just a game and it's not really worth much? I mean, you can get some ideas from, but it, it depends on it. It depends on the structure of the game. Like some games, you can learn good things from, right? And some, depending, like, hey, it's a first-person shooter, but it doesn't obey any of the laws of right. physics, right? You just kind of like Call of Duty shooters. You're probably not learning a whole lot from it. Whereas you get into like some of your more realistic ones, like you can uh, practice squad movements and stuff like that, like armor or something. Right, just um, basic concepts and procedure. Have you ever done any of the VR stuff that the Army has brought out along the way? I did. Um, there was a couple of years ago, there was one, I forget what exactly it's called, but it was it's just like a squad trainer, and you put on this big backpack, and everybody has a weapon, and you have the VR headset on. And it's it's pretty cool, but holy crap, the thing was hot. It's like, it, it <laughs> heated you up so fast. And you're, stand, you're standing in this open bay, with in on this little disc that's like that's your movement area and you move around by a little toggle that's on the front of your rifle and it's like all right this is cool but you, you at the same time you have the computer on your back right and so it's just kicking all of this heat into your spine and you're like uh <laughs> yeah we had a jtac uh, trainer for the jtac i was in alo twice once in germany with the one id and once in korea with the, the second id and we had a vr jtac trainer and that you know the airplane would come in and they could do the lazing and all that stuff. 
So uh, I, I think that stuff is definitely uh, on its way. I noticed you had a coffee. Mm -hmm. what, what do you got? What are you drinking? I am drinking right now. I had some Black Rifle Calf. Mm. I've got a Sumatra, nice dark Sumatra, dark dark coffee kind of guy, or what? I typically go for a little bit lighter blends. Yeah. Um, I've been I've been experimenting a little bit more with being snooty with my coffee in the last year. <laughs> so I took I took an Aero Press with me on this trip. I took a French press with me too, but I ended up uh, selling the French press halfway through because I found I didn't typically drink 32 ounces of coffee at once. Dude, I found that when you are deployed, if, if you have a skill like that, you can become quite popular. See, but a lot of, I try, but a lot of the guys that I was with, they just wanted to drink like the swill Folgers. <laughs> <laughs> so they come out every morning, like, anybody want any good coffee? Like, nah, man, we're good. And they just be just pouring away from this dirty <laughs> pot of Folgers. Like, oh, all right. You, you guys enjoy oh, that one. man. I'm, I'm with you. I have in my, in my old dotage have kind of started to become uh, more accustomed to the nicer coffees, so I'll sort of seek it out. I uh, had a guy, had a uh, subscriber sent me a couple things from, I'm going to mess it up. It's not Orange County. I'm going to forget. But anyway, it was two nice bags of, of good coffee from California. It was, But I also like the Black Rifle. Somebody sent me one of those a couple of years ago, and that was really good as well. Plus, that's owned by veterans, as I, as I remember, right? Yes. Uh, the guys that used to run, um, well, they've, they've run a number of different things, but some of them used to run Article, Article 15 clothing. They made the movie Range 15 and some of the other ones. Um, but they uh, really good dudes. My, my wife and I know them all personally, so they're really, really awesome Oh, no guys. kidding. Yeah, so the, the original founder, uh, Evan, he's Green Beret. You have Matt, who is Army Ranger. Uh, JT, who is a JTAC. Um, Rich Ryan, who he's a YouTuber, but... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, you gotta have somebody who knows how to do that, right? Yeah, you, you got a lot of really great guys. It's veteran company and really good, um, and they make really really good coffee. Their commercials kill me, man. Oh yeah. Yeah, their commercials are. Uh, you gotta love the irreverence and the the connection to the to the community that they they understand it, they get it, having been part yeah. of that community, you know. Yeah, they figure it out really well. Evans Evans really really intelligent with the way he attacks things. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's a cool company, man. There's a couple of others like it out there, very good. All right, so uh, as far as tanks goes, you uh, well, let's talk about streaming real quick because okay. I've mentioned a couple times and and I've said Drinking Brothers Gaming, and then you've told me that you've rebranded it to Jimmy and Nubs. Give us give us that story a little bit. I, I have in the back of my mind. I think I I sort of know what you're going to say, but give us the story of of Drinking Brothers changing to to Jimmy and Nubs. All right, well, we, we decided, um, so we started Drinking Bros Gaming probably four or five years ago now. Uh, originally, the channel was called Drinking Bros Nerds, and then, like, we had a Facebook group, which it got big, and then we had a separate gaming group. And But as the game group kind of grew, like, the gaming group is up over 7,000 people now, so it was kind of like, well, is my channel a representation of the entire group, or is it just me and nubs? Uh, and it's just kind of us. So, like, as we're known around Twitch, most people, Wargaming staff, other watch streamers, anybody else that knows us, typically they know me as Jimmy, and they know my wife as Nubs or Wonder Nubs. And so it just didn't feel like the name Drinking Bros Gaming was quite a good representation of us. So we're like, well, we, we should be, you know, who we are. Everybody knows us as Jimmy and Nubs, so I'll check. And I was like, oh, the Twitch name's available, so let's, uh, let's go for that. And it kind of gives us more free reign to go off in the creative directions that we want if we don't necessarily want to do whatever the Facebook group is doing. Right, right. Well, wow, that's that's actually pretty cool. So, so that sounds to me like you're doing a lot of other games. What else are you? What else are you into? What are you doing? Uh, my wife, she does a lot of RPGs, so she's a big RPG gamer. Uh, we're trying to do some YouTube content and such. Uh, World of Tanks, obviously. A little, little bit of FPS stuff. I like to do. I like to do some good story-based stuff. So I've been playing like Yakuza and things like that. Uh, we're playing a lot of Hades lately. Just a lot of different games that aren't necessarily in the vein of just World of Tanks. All right. Nice. So what? Tell me. So let's get down. Let's dig into World of Tanks a little bit. What brings you back to World of Tanks? What are the things that that you like about it that brings you back? Uh, typically, the, whenever the game changes in some way or another, I kind of like coming back and trying out a little more. Um, it's kind of weird because I've never been a big clan player. Uh, so I've never gotten into like the higher tier clan fights and stuff like that. Like rank battles, I thought was cool. All the new game modes they added the last couple of years, I thought was cool. And mostly just uh, changes in tech trees. 
So like, even though like maybe people aren't excited for them, I kind of excited to try out the Italian heavies that are coming out soon. And mostly just like the, f the fun of grinding. And it just, there aren't many games that kind of hold my attention for grinding. Like I've tried to play a couple of different ones like Warframe or Destiny or some of the other ones that are just these really long kind of grind type games. And World of Tanks is really the only one that kind of holds my attention, even though some of those other games might have, you know, lore and story behind them. I just find I enjoy World of Tanks more, um, whether it's platooning or not. It's hard to beat the content because it, it's based in, in historical accuracy. Of course, we then get off into fantasy tanks and napkin tanks and I, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but the base of it is, you know, you, you get the picture of the Tiger and the T-34 and the Sherman. You know what I mean? Those, those tanks are uh, in, in your brain and then it just expands from there. I personally enjoy the PvP aspect. What, do you like PvP better, or PvE, or are you just kind of both? Or I like PvP better. I mean, I played Armored Warfare back when it was a thing, and like the PvP didn't hold me as much. Or not the PvP, the PvE didn't hold me as much as right. the PvP did. Like I've always enjoyed the PvP aspect a little more. And so it's 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 kind of fun. Like it's really addicting when you have that one game where you just you you make all of the predictions right and just absolutely round somebody. Yeah. Yeah, it's that it's interesting to me because it's that one game in, you know, 20 that sort of brings you back and it's a that's a weird that's a weird thing to me because objectively in my brain I can go, you know what? 19 games I'm average to crummy. And on mm -hmm. the 20th game, I have that epic game that I want to make a video of or talk about or whatever. Isn't it interesting that it's that small a percentage of something that keeps you coming back? But I think that's probably pretty accurate for life you know yeah 95 yeah. percent of the time it's pretty damn boring and then you get that five percent where something really good or really bad is happening <laughs> yeah i can like that simplifies there no it's yeah that's probably what keeps me playing is every once in a while i'll just have that one game like oh that was i think that's why my favorite tanks are the derp tanks i like the the kb2 and the fb215 b183 because it's either it's either going to absolutely ruin your day or it's you're going to have a hell of a time playing it <laughs> yeah, so you get two shots off, do no damage, and die, or you got eight thousand damage. Seems like with that thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else do you do, man? What else are you into other than uh, other than gaming? Uh, mostly mostly streaming and gaming. Like it's yeah. it work pretty much takes up most of my time right now. Uh, I'm waiting for summer to come back around so I can get my motorcycle out. I didn't really get to get it out this last year because uh, I left for Syria. <laughs> get a road bike or a trail bike or yeah. What? I got a big road bike. I got a, a Harley uh, Street Glide. Nice. So it was it was nice riding it down in Florida. The only thing I don't like is like Florida. Yeah, I could ride year round, but everything's a swamp, and there wasn't a whole lot of really good scenery I like to see besides like the beach. I got and, a buddy uh, that's got a Harley, and it's miserable in the summer around here. He says just because of the the, the, the heat humidity. and the humidity. Yeah. Yeah, like if you if you end up at a stoplight for more than like yeah. a couple seconds, you're just like, I'm dying. Get me off of this thing. That's what he said. He's, it put, plus, he wants to be covered up so he doesn't. You know, I saw a guy go by on a bullet bike a couple of days ago, and he had flip flops on. Oh. And I was just like, how? Those are nightmares. Can, yeah, can you be that stupid? How can you be that stupid? I mean, even just putting your foot out, you know? Oh my gosh. Well, I wouldn't trust a flip flop at all because if you 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 take a corner the wrong way, you're going to put your foot down, and the flip flop's going to just rip off. Exactly. Or. You ha you're going to have no protection if you have to lay the bike down. Like if you ever look at pictures of people that have had basically all everything torn off their leg because they're wearing shorts, and it's like, uh, mm -mm. yeah, that's the other thing around here: shorts and t-shirts. Even if they have shoes on, you'll see guys running raging around in shorts and t-shirts. And uh, I don't know. Which man. I, I made that mistake one time of riding in a t-shirt, and I got real dehydrated that day just from like the sun beating on you and making your skin hot, and it, you. I got more dehydrated riding in a t-shirt than I did riding in a full jacket. And so, yeah, I, I only made that mistake once. I guess the, uh, I guess the wind over the skin would also help evaporate more perspiration, which then probably creates more perspiration trying to cool you off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you get, the, you also get that wind chap thing going on. Anytime I'm out on the boat for any length of time in the sun, you know, there's the, there's the sunburn and the wind burn and you've been out, you've been out in the desert. So you get that. Yeah, no, I had some, I didn't get real bad wind burn until like 2014. Like where I was, I was out in Western Afghanistan and just, just the wind was just tearing across the plains out there. What's Afghanistan like, man? Did you interact with the people at all? Yeah, a little bit. 
uh, it was a little bit hard to interact with the people. Well, a lot of the people thought I was an interpreter, so they would come talk to me. But I don't know, <laughs> I don't know Pashtu or Dari, so it didn't really help me very much. <laughs> so I guess <laughs> I'm sorry, man. That's fantastic. So I'm guessing when your the beard gets big, you start sort of blending in a little bit based on the complexion and the is, is that. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I'm 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 a part Middle Eastern. I'm half Middle Eastern. So like any any time I'm in a Middle Eastern country, if I have any bit of facial hair, the the locals immediately think, you know, I'm in I'm an interpreter. That's fantastic. They just roll up to you, start talking and they see yeah, the, they see it, the deer in the headlight look and Well, the thing with Afghans was Afghans, I'd be like I and I try to try to mimic like, look, I don't understand you. Can the, the interpreter is over there. Can you please talk to him? Yeah. And then they keep talking to me in Pashtu until the point where I got angry. It's like, go away from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Typically yeah. with more expletives, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe they thought you're playing hard to get or something. It typically, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's the the locals in Afghanistan are very different. Um, just because it is so, I'm not gonna say backward, but just behind because of it, just the history of Afghanistan. Right. Just bomb, bomb back to the Stone Age so many times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't exactly the. Uh wasn't exactly the vanguard of, of civilization to begin with, other than maybe in in the big city. Yeah, I think, yeah, because, I mean, they, you, they legitimately would move into areas and people would still think we were the Russians from the 80s. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, it really happened. Because they're just out there, aren't they? I mean, they're just, they're just not, inter they don't have to interact with the world. It's not, not it's not something that matters to them because they're busy nope. trying to make a living on their, on their scrap of land or whatever they're trying to do right there. I mean, they're very tribal. They're very, very self-sufficient. So a lot of people won't ever go outside the province, and sometimes not even their village. Uh, so it's like, hey, if we have everything we need to live here in the village, why do we need to go anywhere else? I think that's got to be hard to comprehend for a young, for a young army guy going out there, who's lived in the U.S. and understands, you know, who's probably been on a plane and gone across the U.S. and understands you can go to other countries. Never mind the next village. You know, he probably drove to the next town to go to McDonald's or whatever, or whatever he wanted to do. Just the concept of when he, he gets around the these these people and try to try to relate to them. That's got to be really difficult. Did you did you run into that? I mean, you don't spend as much time with them. It's like you you will. It's kind of like uh, there's not a whole lot of like the lower level guys interacting with a lot of the villagers because they don't really want you to do that too right. much. Typically, you'll have like the leadership, either a captain or something, or your lieutenant will go and they're like, "Hey, we're gonna have dinner with the uh, typically the ANA or somebody, uh, the National Army." But very rarely did you actually sit down with the locals and have like meals. And but when you were walking through like a bazaar or something, you'd wave and say hi, and you know the kids would follow you around and show you stuff. Yeah. And so that was it was kind of cool. Typically, the kids are pretty nice. Um, some of the some of the adults are pretty pretty cool. But then you you would definitely run into the ones that you're like, oh, this guy wants to kill me. <laughs> like, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, just mean mugging you the whole time. Oh, just by the or way they're kidding. watching you or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you'd have the guys that it, it were very clearly uh, insurgents or they were affiliated with insurgents, and they just like there's nothing you can do. He's not holding a rifle. He's not, you know, he has nothing to do. He can just walk up and shake your hand. And we've had that happen where a guy walk up and shake her hand and then hours later be like oh that's the guy that in place that ied like oh cool he was just trying to shake my hand before he tried to kill me like yeah that's messed up <laughs> yeah i mean i've seen that look myself when i was there we we had driven into a we're going around a circle we've gone we're going over to baghdad international from where the marines are staying because i was going back over to the uh to the army side over there and they were busy having some kind of dispute you know and pulling down i think one of the Saddam statues that was in there and we had about five humvees but they were sort of as we were going around the circle to try to get out of that particular intersection there was a bunch of guys who came up next to the humvees and i had the nine bill in my lap right there and the guy comes up right into the window at a soft side and i had the window of the plastic thing flapped down and you know he looked me right in the eye and I, I i pretty much knew looking at that dude i'm like if he had a gun i think he'd probably just shoot me right here mm -hmm just based on yeah. the way he was looking at me. You know, of course we're invading this country, so I sort of get what he's, where he's coming from, but yeah, I've seen, I've seen that look. It's, it's not very pleasant. And then he saw the nine bill sitting there and he backed up, but that was, the... that's my best war story. It, it, it's the whole, that's <laughs> it. The rest of it was a crappy camping trip. <laughs> I mean, they're all crappy camping trips. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. 
I always tell I mean, people if if I got shot at, I don't I don't know. I'm blissfully unaware, so that's that's good for me. <laughs> yeah. I never had. I never got. Well, I never got shot at for a really long period of time. I've only had a few like actual firefights, but yeah. it just it's, a few. It, okay. I, it's yeah. That's I think one's I enough, man. <laughs> I mean, people want to shoot at us. That's it yeah. happens. It just depends on whether you're actually in a position to be able to shoot back. Sometimes you are. Sometimes it's like, well, this day sucks. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you don't know where the hell it's coming from or what the hell's going on, yeah. All right. So, uh, what's what's the future for Jimmy as far as Twitch goes? Where where are you going, man? What are you trying to? I'm just trying to grow. Like, I'm I'm kind of moving to like multiple platforms at the time. Um, not necessarily just focusing on Twitch. We're trying to do some YouTube stuff. We're trying to do some uh, smaller form stuff. Hold on. Oh yay. Thank you, hon. Is this Nubs? It is Nubs. Wonder Nubs. Hello. She's uh she's just getting moving. Excellent. She's. I got her some coffee earlier. Um, Perfect. but the future for us is kind of uh, yeah, we're just looking to expand in more content, really make more of a name as just Jimmy and Nubs and necessarily Drinking Bros Gaming. And so I'm I'm kind of looking forward to that. Uh, I look forward to. I got to get better with some video editing stuff. So. <laughs> I've got I've got some experience with it, but not enough to be comfortable in the way that I make videos. So just a little bit cleaner edits, better transitions, you know, uh, better storyboarding before I make a video, stuff like that. And so we're just gonna try and grow, man, yeah, just really outward, any any direction. So I've got three years till retirement. My wife's already got her full retirement, and so uh, pretty much once I retire, I just kind of plan to make video content. I know uh, I know enough of the guys at Black Rifle and Ranger Up that. I want to do some stuff with them. I just gotta call and be like, "Hey, let's let's work on some stuff," and just convince them. Oh, that's awesome! And so, so tip, what, what is your? Have you done any YouTube stuff yet, or you're just getting started with it? Just getting started, really. Like, what do you want to do? Just here's a video game I'm playing. Like, show video game play, or I'm mean, gonna do some. We can yeah. do some let's plays, but um, it's gonna be more more reviews along the line. Um, so like for, I've been trying to figure out like what is if I were to make World of Tanks videos, what is my niche? Do I want to do like how do I want to do it? And it's like, well, I don't really want to do tank reviews because I watch at least four different people that do a tank review on every single tank that comes out. Do I want to sit and say the same stuff that they're gonna say? And it's like, well, I need to make something that kind of only I can do. So it's like I can talk a little bit about the game, a little bit about the updates, give my I'm not gonna say necessarily raw input on it. At the same time, there's there's certain things like I have a very good understanding of the way uh, munitions work. So like I can sit and tell you like when we talk about hey how does a heat round work, I can tell you how an actual heat round really works, or how an EFP works, or how uh, uh, dispensed or retained uh, dispensers work, or how all of that stuff works. And so it, it's kind of one of those things where I can give a little bit more insight on the historical side. It just comes down to putting it in a way that's still entertaining for people. Yeah, you got that domain knowledge expertise in the EOD side that you can try to leverage for what you're doing with the with the video. Mm -hmm. I think there's a pretty big market for straightforward opinion stuff, and uh, what what I've been aiming at is the older community. And I, you know, not to not to say you're old, but I think you're kind of are in that older gamer area. And that's not that's not a pejorative anymore. I think it probably no. was 20 years ago. But there's so many of us now that have grown up gaming that are our age, my age, so I'm older than you, but in your age, who are who have been gamers their entire life. And I think there is starting to become a pretty big market for people to stream and make videos and things. It's not just, although the, the kid market, I call it the kid market, but you know, the kind of hyperactive young stuff, young adult, you know, lots of memes and sounds and, you know, fart noises and all that stuff. That that's all That's all good and it makes a lot of money for some people. But I think the older piece of it uh, that I like to consider myself sort of in the vanguard of trying to develop or uh, at least ride along with. I think that's a big market and it's getting bigger. So that's that's been what I've been sort of aiming at with this. And it's got some traction in World of Tanks because World of Tanks, I think, skews an older audience. It does. It definitely, uh, I think I think, I think think the target for World of Tanks, well, like late 20s to, I mean, all the way into retirement, well, well into the retirement. I mean, most of the people, I think I have more people to watch me that are retirement age than are in, near my age. <laughs> yeah, most of my community is old. I, I hate that word. I hate my community. Most of the community that I'm in is old. Um, you call them your community. It's, it's one of those things that, like, 
I, I've kind of been getting over is like uh, people people come to my stream and when they sub I'm like I don't I don't know why you're why you're doing this why are you giving me money like, I, <laughs> That's right. That's this, this this isn't worth watching That's right. and they're like well we just like being here and it's like well at some point you kind of have to accept that you are you are responsible for the audience that you've gathered and they're happy to be there so you can call that your community that's a good way to look at it i like that i like that uh you know it, it just felt very self-indulgent it, which it is what, which is what you're telling me to get over and, and i'll i'll do my dangdest but i'll t it's still it, it is a weird feeling and maybe i haven't been at it as long enough like you have but i've had the same question in my brain i'm thinking why why is anybody paying attention to what the hell i'm doing on YouTube or Twitch or whatever. Um, but if they find entertainment in it or they find interest in it, then I find interest in them and I think that's that's good. Yeah, and they can bring different aspects to your content simply from their points of view. And it's it, it, it does take time to get by that like, hey, what, why, why are you here like moment? Like it's just, this sucks. Because in your own head, you're constantly critiquing everything that you do, like every little nip and little pinch. And you're like, all right, that sucked. And then, hold on, my cat is attacking my other cat. <laughs> Excellent. What are their names? Uh, I have three of them. We have we have our old cat Kippy. We have our and then the twins Naga and Pabu, um, <laughs> which are our tabbies. Our cat Kippy, she's thirteen, and Pabu and Naga are four. And so she doesn't want them to mess with her. They want to play, and she wants to be left alone. She does not want to play. Yeah, I've got a dog yeah. and a cat. The cat. I'll just, the, the dog we got as a rescue, we take the dog for a walk. One day, about three months ago, I'm walking down the, the road with the dog in the middle of the road. And this cat, who had been hanging around the street for the last probably two months, and we'd interacted with it a little bit. It was, it was friendly enough, but it was very definitely a, a stray and mm -hmm. uh, was fairly young. And we, I walk out there, and this cat comes straight up to the dog. And they sniff noses, and the cat goes around the dog's legs. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, what on it? And the heck is going on here? And about a week later, we'd adopted the cat. So there you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, my, my, uh, so we have, we have a big yellow lab that was my wife's service animal. And we also have a little chihuahua. The chihuahua is a rescue that followed them home, uh, followed her home when she was in San Antonio. And then the big male cat, who's one of the twins, he thinks that the yellow lab is his mother. So he is always <laughs> cuddling the yellow lab. He'll sleep next to her. He'll follow her around the house. It's it's pretty cute. And uh, when we used to walk the dogs when we were down in Florida, uh, we can't walk them anymore because they're they're now too old and they have bad hips and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but the cats would sneak out the back and follow us on walks around the neighborhood. So we'd be walking the dogs, and you'd look back and you'd just see these sets of eyes watching us from the bushes, darting from bush to bush. <laughs> That's what ours does. I take yeah. I take the dog out, and the first probably block. The cat is shadowing us, running from bush to bush and under cars and, you know, looking at us. And then we'll go across the one street that never crosses and it'll fade away. And it'll be there when we come back, waiting for us on the other street when we come around the other way. Oh, yeah. They go on walks with you. Make sure you're safe. <laughs> Don't leave yeah. me. Yeah, they're awesome. All right, man. Let's let's get down to the to brass tacks here. Artie or no? I'm not an Artie guy. I can't. <laughs> I got it's I've tr the couple of times I've played Artie, I, I play it off stream. Like I just, I don't enjoy the game. <laughs> Except you're hiding in the closet playing Artie, yeah? Yeah. So like, I, I don't enjoy it and it's like, I get it. There's, there's some missions I got to do to play it, but it's never, I never sit down like, oh man, I can't wait to crap on this guy from across the map. Like, <laughs> it's just not my thing. Like I, I get its place in the game, but it's not my style. Right. Right. So a uh, wheel tanks, yay or nay? I can get down with wheel tanks. Um, I mean, they still, it still needs some balancing. I, I think people's main reason why they don't like the wheeled tanks is that it, it legitimately changed the pace of the game so much. Like, it, it's, you, you got to take, like, back when we only had the tracked lights, you could get into positions a little bit faster, or you could get into positions more safer before mm -hmm. getting spotted. But now you have these wheel tanks that can get real deep inside your line so fast that it legitimately changes the pace of the game, and it changes, it changes the meta. And I think a lot of the people, some of the older crowd, doesn't like that because it's it, it changed the pace. There's no other way I can say that. No, I would, <laughs> I would agree with that, and I, and I, I feel very similar to that, similarly to that. I mean, I'm 53 years old. I, I can still play at a pretty high level. 
and my twitch skills are, are decent, not amazing. So I can, I can get around it, but I do, I do understand because it does affect me too. And a lot of my community are older and they absolutely hate them for exactly the reason you said, I think, I think wargaming has to be careful here. I think there's two things going on. Number one is they have to try to open up the aperture and bring as many gamers into the game as possible because they want to make money and be popular and all that good stuff. But the core group of gamers that came to this game early on were all older people. And one of the things they liked, in my opinion, I think this is true. It's anecdotal, but I've, seen, I've heard it so many times from my community that I have to believe it's mostly true is that the older gamers were attracted to the game because it wasn't such a twitchy FPS, you know, exactly. pixel sniping game where you, because I'll go, my son plays the FPSs. I'll, I'll log in, I'll be like, okay, and I'm just like, what happened? He goes, well, you got shot in the head by that guy over there. He spun around, did 360 and shot you. I'm like, oh, great, that was fun, you know? So, and that's an extreme example, but I think a lot of them liked the, what I call the stately pace of the game. Yeah. No, I agree, and I think that's why a lot of them still like uh, like warships. Warships is kind of in that same same boat. Where it runs a little bit slower than your average FPS. It's not spawn die, spawn die, spawn die, spawn die. It's like, all right, I'm gonna have this one life. It's gonna go, you know, eight to ten to fifteen minutes. Whereas, like, yeah, with the the, it just it changed the pace to such a way where it makes people uncomfortable. And I think, I don't think those tanks are gonna go away. And I'm. I'm comfortable with them existing because I don't have a whole lot of trouble dealing with them, but I do think they still require tuning yeah. um, even more than they have been recently. Like it's for me, the biggest thing is just the wheels eating shots. Like the wheel should need a shot. Like it should, it should get yeah. hit. Not, not being tracked. I, I've talked about this a lot on my channel, not being tracked, but getting tracked is such a, a basic mechanic that has developed in the game over time. And I have no, no idea if the developers, intended for that to be such a such a meta mechanic of the game where you track mm -hmm. someone so you pin them down and then you can kill them get assist all that kind of thing but that's what has happened so whatever their whatever their uh you know desires were when they made the game when you hand it to the players the players develop a meta and you have to react to that in one way or the other whether it's nerfing or buffing depending on what's going on you you can't let the gamers own it and decide everything but at the same time, you yeah. have to appreciate what, what is developed. And these things are, are an outlier in mechanics because they don't get tracked. And I think, for me, they need to be slowed down a lot more when they get hit. Not stopped, but even more so. And I would agree with you that they need another probably nerf of some kind. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, yeah, no, I agree with you fully on that one. I, I could see them being slowed down, which, I mean, I haven't, I haven't played them too much since, since the most recent nerf. I understand they slowed them down, what was it, like 50%? I forget the yeah exact it was it wasn't exactly that I, I read it and it had to do with how many wheels were hit and then whether or not the the deflection off the wheel actually did damage or was just deflected and it just you know what I mean it I don't see an appreciable difference to be quite honest in the the EBRs getting slowed down that much I think to get an idea of that I'd have to look and see like what were the stats on the EBRs before and after the right. nerf or before and after the nerf and then maybe that'd give me an idea but I I can't see the difference but I think it's one of those things you're only really going to know if you play it more. Yeah, so they I, definitely I, I, slow I down. Yeah, they definitely slow down. Seven. Oh, you're on the tier seven. Yeah, I've got I've got the tier seven wheel tank. Like I started playing them, but at the time I wasn't really in the mood for light tanks. So I've I'm kind of getting up to my light tanks. I'm at tier nine on most of them, but I, I still got to finish them out. Yeah, the uh, the eight is where you get the boost, where they go even faster if you if you oh, press yeah. the boost. And they they didn't nerf the the FL10. The premium did not get nerfed. Oh, that thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, <laughs> yeah. it's probably one of the more busted premiums that have gone in in a long time. Yeah. So that was my, actually my good, good segue because the next thing was premium tanks and, and overpower, specifically the reward tanks. Do you have any? And what are, what's your opinion? I'm talking uh, Chieftain. I'm talking 279 early, that kind of stuff. I don't. I have some of the reward tanks. I don't have, like, I don't have the two, the top tier ones. I don't have the 260. I don't have the 279. I don't have the Chieftain. Um, I think like a lot of it gets kind of skewed because you're looking at these tanks are being played by the best players in the game, but at the same time, they are still stronger than their tech tree counterparts and a lot of the other ones. I mean, that's why you see, you don't see super conquerors out there anymore. You see chieftains. Right. If you have a chieftain, you play a chieftain over a super conqueror. 
It's just like the reason why even people that have the FB215 b would play the Super Conqueror over because the Super Conqueror is better. Um, and it's because of the turret and the armor and it's just, just the gun to press. It's just the tank in itself. And so I think um, putting those in in the, the state that they are, like it, they do need balancing and it was kind of rough on that. I think that's probably where Wargaming has had the biggest issue the last couple of years is when they're putting these tanks in, they're not balancing them super well. But I think that's what we're kind of seeing on the reverse side now with when they're bringing these new tech trees in, they're always very underwhelming. I mean, the last couple of tech trees that have come in, can you say any of the British lights or Polish mediums or even the upcoming Italian heavies, do they look like they're absolutely amazing? That's Yeah, the, think, the best think, of the Italian heavies may be the Basante that's already out and it's the premium. Yeah, and so it's, it's kind of one of those things where it, they kind of need to take a better look at some of these tanks before they put them out. Like the, the reward tanks, I wouldn't see any issues with them nerfing them. I remember when they nerfed the, the T-22 medium into the ground and it never came back. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I don't know. If they start adjusting those, they're going to push off a lot of the hardcore. It needs some work. Like I've, see, I've watched some of the guys play it and it's like, okay, well, you can't shoot it in the front, okay. You can't shoot it in the side, or I mean, you can shoot it in the side. You can't shoot it in the tracks. It's just it's one of those tanks that throws people off because it doesn't conform to the norms, like right. like the wheeled tanks. Like you can blow the tracks off of it, but you're never going to get the damage. And yeah. so, like, to do, you you have to load premium, and that's the other thing is the game is balanced around premium rounds. So they're making these tanks like, all right, you're going to have to shoot premium with this thing from the front. Yeah, and that, that is that is true. The game is definitely, you know, it's got a three-tier system. That that introduces a lot of issues that they've put in the premium rounds to try to help that. And they have balanced it around those, which means if you're if you're just going to fire regular rounds, you're really gimping yourself pretty badly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Give me give me your your one best piece of advice for playing the game. Uh, learn your vision mechanics. Vision uh, mechanics. Vision mechanics, I think, are vision mechanics separate a lot of like mid tier and higher tier play, like being able to know like when you're going to be spotted or predicting when you're spotted before six cents. So like I know with the new crew system that they're trying to make uh, six cents is going to be like stock on everything, which is fine, but at the same time that's going to create the issue of people are going to rely on it so much that they're going to get that complaint of. Uh, well, how did you? Sp I wasn't spotted till then, not realizing that they have that couple of second delay. Right. And so learning vision mechanics and kind of anticipating, hey, I'm going to be spotted when I do this, or I'm spotted here, or this guy probably spotted me here, will save you a lot more often than not. Yeah, that, so that, that's good. That, yeah. That's yeah. my suggestion for players: is lear learn your vision mechanics even more than maybe your shooting mechanics or angling or anything else. Vision mechanics will absolutely save you in this game. Yeah, I think the basics of of shooting, of weak spots, and to some extent angling, I'm going to say they're fairly easy. That's that's simplifying it a little too much, but the general idea of I W A S D, I point my gun and I shoot, and learning you know, it's better to shoot at a weak spot, is is better than shooting at a strong spot. Those are all fairly basic concepts, but you know, once you get into uh, once you get into things like vision mechanics, now you're getting into the very complicated part of the game. And, and mm -hmm. that includes for me, things like initial positioning, repositioning, watching the flow of the game, understanding when you need to move and when you don't need to move and all that kind of stuff right there. And that's things that I'm still weak on is like uh, reading, reading the flow of the battle and kind of being like, all right, this is about to fall. I need to move. And so it's like you try it, but sometimes your timing's off and you just end up kind of wandering around the map. Like, all right, well, <laughs> Oops! Yeah, leave yeah. a position, then everybody there dies, and you're like, "Ah, oh, crap! My my mistake. I'm sorry." Like, I'm good for one of those on a stream where I'll be talk because I talk to myself as I go, and I say, "All right, we need to move. This is not going well." And I'll drive away, and then I'll be looking and go, "I should have stayed because that guy is now winning, and I'm not there to help him, and now I'm wandering around in useless places on the map." <laughs> yeah, and it yeah, it just takes time. I I don't like some of the guys that I watch. Um, like you're watching people like Overlord Prime, True Voodoo, and some of those very high tier guys that are watching it and they just read it like, all right, I got to move over here. Or like skill, like I, I can't play on that tier anywhere near it. 
yeah. but they're just watching them read the way they do. It's like, all right, well, that's pretty impressive. He can see it and make the best play for himself. Yeah. The, you know, talking about skill and, and a couple of those guys like that, the, the thing that strikes me with them on, on occasion is the fact that, that where they're aiming is not a mistake, as in in between shots, like where they where they put their, I call it uh, mouse work, camera work, what, where their camera's looking, what view they're using, because I will consistently see them take shots that I'm like, how did he, how, how was he ready for that shot so well? And how was it so smooth? And holy cow, it hit and pinned. And I know RNG is involved, but it, and you may have run into this in the military. You know, I had people say, you make your own luck. If you're skilled enough and you're, and you're in the right position and you're ready enough, you can make luck, right? It, it looks mm-hmm. lucky, but you're actually in a position to, to do something with the luck you got. You gave yourself the best odds. You gave yourself the best odds. And I see them do this consistently. And sometimes I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. That is not something that, that I can do right now. As, as much as say as I can gather at times and as good as I am in, in breaking down replays and helping people, you know, get better at the game. There's that next higher tier that you just look at and go, I wish I could break this down, but I, to be quite honest, I'm not exactly sure how they did that. <laughs> I think I think it just requires thousands upon thousands of hours. <laughs> yeah. Well, geez, it's... I got that. I'm I'm still not there. Holy cow. <laughs> you know, everyone's it's... got a st- kill ceiling, though, right? I mean, you've seen that. You probably oh, yeah. you probably know some guys that are uh, legends in the EOD field, and you have no idea how sometimes they manage to do what they do. And you probably have guys that are just competent. You know, we had the same thing in the fighter community. They're yeah, all at a good guys. level, right? But there's still stratifications in within that group of very intelligent, very high performing people. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a couple of those guys that are just like, how how did you do that? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you try and to learn something from it, and and I, I'm not probably exaggerating a little bit. It's not so much like how did you do that. It's just there's there's multiple steps to where he got that. They all happen so fast, right? He just he just flowed. Whereas you you I won't talk for you, but whereas I will be like you know just i'm getting there but it's it's not in a nice smooth flow you you're stopping thinking you're thinking about it step by step whereas he's he's more he's more a little bit more instinctive right right yeah yeah so uh skill-based matchmaking i don't think skill-based matchmaking is like we we have ranked battles for that um skill-based matchmaking like it slows down even the biggest games. So, I mean, you look at League of Legends skill-based matchmaking, it still takes time, but it's, I, I don't, I, I hate to say it, I don't think Wargaming has a big enough player base to work on skill-based matchmaking, especially in some of the smaller regions like NA. Right. Um, I think skill-based matchmaking would take forever, and I don't think you'd see a lot of people that would really want to hop into skill-based matchmaking. Like, you'll see the high-tier guys that want to hop in there, but like I said, that's what Ranked Battle is for. Right. Uh, yeah, that's that's all I got to say about that one. Well, speaking of other regions, have you played on EU or RU? Have you done any of that kind of thing? You know, I started an EU account when I was overseas this time because I actually had when I was in Syria, I only had like eighty ping up to the EU server, but I just didn't. I couldn't get into it. I couldn't start grinding all the way from the bottom again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like I, I started and I was like, all right, I got this tier four tank, and I played like two battles, and I was like, nope, I can't, I can't do it. Maybe, I sort of got it's... sucked in onto it, man. I, I started one two months ago to because I'd heard everything about EU is different. You use this, you use that, and is this, and is that. I couldn't talk to it because I had, I didn't didn't know anything mm-hmm. about it. So I started started an EU account. I just got sucked into the grind again, man. Starting over, it was crazy. Maybe if I have a platoon mate or something, I'll be able to I'll be able to do it because I've had a few friends like, hey man, you should start an EU account. I'm like, oh maybe. I don't know if I want to sink that much more money into the game again. What kind of ping do you get? <laughs> do you know from where you are there? Any, uh, any idea? I'm not sure. I'd have to check. I'm. I mean, I'm all the way on the west coast. Right. So my ping is probably pretty awful. Yeah, mine's 120 to 140 on a good day, and I, I do notice the difference in, when mm-hmm. the pings like that. I mean, it's not unplayable, but I lose a lot of close fights where you know you're both clicking about the same time, and uh, I, I will. It's no. It is noticeable. Not all the time. Not all the time. But it's definitely definitely noticeable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely get that. It's just, it, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll give it a shot one of these days. Uh, I could, I could start fresh, and it's, I've had ideas for stuff like, hey, what if I just start a new account, new account, and just go, 
free to play, but I don't I don't think know if I have the patience to go completely free to play. That's kind of what I did, and I did some new player experience bids, and I kind of you know I'd never used a blueprint because I had unlocked everything before blueprints mm -hmm. came out. And when a new line comes out, I just grind it because that's part of you know what I'm doing with the channel. So why go through a tank with the blueprints and not play it to let guys know, guys and gals know what's going on? Um, yeah. But you know that's that's kind of what I did. All right. So your community. Tell us something about this. So people are watching this and thinking, hey, I need to check out uh, Jimmy and, and what he does. Describe describe your community and what it is. What's it about? My community is more about um, well, mostly just having fun with the game. Like it's it's not it's not super technical. Like if you have questions, I'm always willing to answer questions. Like we can get into the technicalities of things if we have to. But for the most part, it's about trying to find a good time while you're playing the game. So like I'm I'm big on like hey if if you're beating your head against the wall because you're on game 10 and it's your 10th loss, maybe close the game and, you know, grab a coffee, play a different game, play something that's just chill, read a book. And I, I very much try and push in my community. You should be having fun when you're playing the game. It's not, it's not super hardcore sweaty. So, I mean, we can get that way. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll get into a game and I'll have a just really angry loss. And it's like, all right, well, you know, it's time, time to play something different. And so I can't always say I'm about positivity. <laughs> I do get salty, uh, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't help but get salty, but I try, I don't get offensive with it. I don't, I'm, I'm not calling people names. Like, all right, this guy just kind of let me down. Fine. And it's just like, <laughs> but it, it's my community. Like, there's no other way to say it, which is about, we're about having fun being goofy and uh, just kind of learning through that. Yeah. Casuals. So that, that's 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 interesting because that's that's kind of the way I come at it, and and I think sometimes, and, and I'll just ask it this way: you, the job you do in real life is a stressful job when you're doing it. Yes, clearly. I mean, you're diffusing explosives or neutralizing them or getting rid of them or transporting them or all the many things that EOD does. And I found this in in fighter aviation that when we had our off time, we 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 worked hard, played played hard. And sometimes people take, mistake passion for anger. Mm -hmm. So when I play and I get some, now I will get salty too. I'm not going to claim that I'm some kind of, you know, unsalty saint or anything. But I do get excited about the game at times and I get into it. But there's a difference between passion and anger. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I find people that do jobs like we did are often very high energy people quite often and, and there's a lot of passion in everything they do no you should see my wife stream she gets <laughs> she's, was she, she EOD as well she was oh, um, shit. So you, you might have you've probably seen a picture of her floating around somewhere she was EOD uh, she got blown up in Iraq in 2007 uh, she lost both of her arms above the elbow oh, so geez. she's missing both her arms just above the elbow but she she games and she streams on the channel now too uh, but we both we both kind of feed. We have that kind of, well, actually, that's the other thing with the channel is me and her just kind of uh, talk crap to each other most of the time. But we kind of have that weird gallows military humor, but it's between like a married couple. So <laughs> right on. We're, yeah. Okay. We're just, just ripping into each other most of the time. <laughs> I don't, I don't imagine the EOD community is very uh, uh, cuddly. No, there's there's a lot of things, <laughs> there's a lot of jokes that we can't say online and on right. Twitch, that are they're far too dark for far too many people. Yeah. And yeah. so, but occasionally it'll leak out and people will be like, "Holy what?" And like, oh, sorry, you that wasn't really for meant that. for you. Actually, that was yeah, that was. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, but not to get too technical, but how does she how does she interact with the? Does she have special devices? How does she interact uh, with the keyboard? Typically, she types on the keyboard, typically either with her feet or like she'll tap it one at a time. Um, we put the keyboard down by her feet, so yeah, she, yeah. she has easier time typing that way. She plays most games with her feet. Um, we got uh, an Xbox adaptive controller, which is <clears throat> nicely given to us by Xbox. One of one of our good friends helped design the Xbox adaptive controller with her in mind, so they gave her one, and so it was nice because she's able to play a lot of games that she didn't necessarily wasn't able to use a lot. Uh, trigger support or the bumpers on like an Xbox controller before. So she typically plays that way with, um, uh, let's see, what's her, what's her big thing? She's playing through Mass Effect again, I think. Was and she a gamer so she, before? 
she was. Yeah. Uh, not not quite as much as she is now, but she was she was before. Um, her her and her dad used to always game when they were little, or when she was little, they played Doom and stuff together. Oh no, kidding. Yeah, her That's dad's awesome. uh, her, her dad was a Vietnam vet and the sher- uh, under sheriff of the county. Uh, he was in the Air Force and he was a mechanic on. I think they're called Sky Raiders. It was like yeah, the last Force. plane. Yeah. Oh, 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 the uh, yeah, 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 the big prop, the bit with the big. Uh, they were Sky Raiders, yeah. T. Yeah. T twenty eight. No, it's a Trojan. I know what you're talking about. T. Yeah, I can't remember six or something. I can't remember what it was. But yeah, he was a mechanic on those in Vietnam, and so he's me and him. Every time we we I go to the house, we sit down and. We don't swap war stories, but he's always we always just kind of give each other the approving grunt, like uh, uh what's up, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great that you guys can game together like that. I mean, I know it's uh, for me, it 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 was always a release. And if some stuff was stressful at work or whatever, you could always come home and uh, you know mess around with that a little bit. All all done in the correct portions, you know. Hang out with the family. Don't don't sit in the basement all day gaming, all that kind of stuff. You know, keeping that healthy balance, which when you do something like what you do is you have to do that or, or you can really get yourself into a tailspin pretty quick. The balance has been something I've, been, I've had to work on the last the last two years. Uh, when I was in when I was down in Florida teaching, uh, I was teaching at the EOD school for a couple of years. And it was it was nice because I got off work in predictable time every day. But I got sunked into the hole of just getting off work, coming home, taking off my uniform and hopping on stream. And so I was, you know, working 10 hours a day and then coming home and streaming 10 hours. And it's like, I can't do that. And I just put myself in this miserable hole where I was just all the time. And so that's kind of my goal. Like a little bit of the rebranding with this is to let us kind of structure ourselves a little better. Yeah. Of not getting sucked into doing, you know, 10, 12 hour streams every week of, you know, limit myself three to five hours that way i have time to you know accomplish all the adult things that i need to do in the house like you know cleaning and stuff and cooking and all the things that i supposed to, that i'm supposed to do yeah and at the same time give me a chance to work on other things did, did you find at first when when you you worked your 10 hours and you're like oh awesome you know i got this i won't say cush job but it's easier than running around in the desert right i'm, I'm teaching i'm enjoying the teaching part I'm going to go home and holy cow, I can't believe I have all this time to stream. Did it kind of start that way? Like, oh, this yes. is going to be awesome. I'm going to be able to do all the, you know, stream all my ass off and, you know, and then eventually yeah. you sort of come to that realization what you were just saying, right? Yeah, no, it was, it was, I had, I had that extra time. I was getting off work at two, three, four o'clock every day. And if it was, you know, if I had opened that day, I was getting off work at noon and I was like, all right, this is, this is great. You know, I can stream all the time. And it just came down to like I was neglecting a lot of the things around my house. I was neglecting spending time with my wife. Like we were neglecting spending time with each other because we were either one of us was streaming or playing video games all day. It's like we had to find that time to like, all right, let's stop. Let's cook dinner together. Let's watch a movie. Let's, you know, spend some time with our animals and not, you know, just sit in the same sweaty chair in front of the same computer all day. That is so valid, man. The other day, I don't remember what. Sunday or something like that. And I had planned to sit down and stream for three or four hours. And uh, my wife said, hey, let's walk down to a place called St. Andrews. We'll go to the Slice House. We'll walk there. I'm like, that's like five miles down there. He's like, yeah, it's a wonderful day in Florida. It's winter and it's 55 degrees. Let's, you know, we can't walk anywhere in the summer. And I, I was about to say, no, I'm going to stream. And I went, exactly what you're saying. You know, I'm, I'm kind of in this a similar place right now. I said, yeah, yeah, let's, let's walk our arses down there and, uh, you know, I, I came back with bloody nubs because I'm a big fat, you know, no exercise and loser right now. But I need, you know, the call intention is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dude, be careful, my friend. You said three years? Three years. Yeah, don't get fat, man. I I mean, I worked out a considerable amount. And, you know, we have our Air Force PT test. And I always, always got top, you know, the top percentage or whatever on the thing, top score. And... When I and I kept working out for about two years after I retired, and then it just slowly slacked off. Not not because of injury, not because of anything. And here I am, fifty pounds heavier, fifty than when I retired, you know, seven years ago. And that is ridiculous. So I'm telling you, Jimmy, do not do that, my friend. That's where the wife and I got to keep each other honest. We we both put on a little bit of weight being down at the schoolhouse because again, 
Yeah. We were all streaming and just sitting and drinking and nobody being down there. Nobody, nobody made the instructors PT. Like it, it was PT whenever you wanted a PT. And it's like, all right, well, that's cool. And then whenever I wanted a PT it was like once a month. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back, I came back to a unit and I was like, oh my God, I'm out of shape. And uh, yeah, so if we've, we've both kind of made some strides over the last year to, to try and get back in shape. So like we have a little gym in the house where she can work out. Uh, we actually just put an elliptical in there the other day so that we can we can both get our cardio on at home. It's so uh, I, feel, I feel pretty good about that. Yeah, that's that, and that's a good idea. It's it's a pretty powerful thing when you, you hate to be forced to PT, but at the same time, it was a very structured environment for the 23 years I was in. And most units, I did run into a situation like you're talking about, where I was uh, I was instructing, and didn't have to worry about PT. We had a test, but if you could just submit on the test, I still did good on the test because I'd, I'd work out for three months before, but I gained a bunch of weight on that same thing, you know, and it, you, you get there, you're just like, it's a good thing that I had PT tests in the Air Force because what I learned about myself when I retired is I would have been a fat bastard because I yeah. like beer. <laughs> you know, I like I'm beer. Right there with you. I really like whiskey. <laughs> That's good. Uh, now, that was my next question because you mentioned beer, but beer or whiskey? I'm a whiskey man. I uh, I like. I actually have two, if you can see them. Well, it's two bottles behind me. I have a little decanter back there. I was actually having myself some Four Roses last night. <laughs> uh, I like Four Roses. I, I like. I used to drink like Crown Royal a lot when I was younger. So bourbon uh, then. I'm a bourbon guy. Okay. Um, I can do a little bit. Of, I like Canadian. I like Irish. I'm not a Scotch guy. I don't like Scotch, um, and I don't like rye, but most most others, I do like. You ever drank a, a thing called the Jeremiah weed? I haven't tried Jeremiah weed. Yeah, it's like Southern uh, Comfort, and it but sucks worse. If you can, oh. ima- if you can imagine. <laughs> that sounds pretty. It's awful. like a bad batch of Southern Comfort, man. It's the fighter wanna... pilot drink for some reason. I don't know why. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're... fighter pilots need better drink. Uh, well, well, there's a big legend maybe about it. Bud so Light. <laughs> It's a, a shot of Jeremiah weed. Oh man, we don't have. I think our thing, our drinking things, always have just been. I think picklebacks. Our guys always do picklebacks with stuff. What is? What's that? It's it's a chaser. So like you'll do a shot of something and then you you drink a shot of pickle juice right <laughs> afterward. What? It it cuts it cuts the burn. Apparently it cuts the bite and it helps with the hangover because you're ingesting all of that salty brine. I don't know. I don't like pickles and I don't like pickle juice, so I've never done one. <laughs> pickle? I have never heard of a pickle back. Yeah, if you, I mean, I, I, I promise you can find it at any bar around your area. If you if you go in and be like, hey, I want a pickle, give me a shot of this with a pickle back, and they'll give you a shot glass with whatever you ask for, and then a shot and then a shot glass full of pickle juice. You know what? That has to be why there are often in bars around here bottles of pickles sitting around. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure they sell them too, but I bet they probably drain off the pickle juice for that purpose. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna have to try that just for giggles. See if uh, see if one of these guys knows what that is. That's that's. Fantastic. Our our guys like it. I don't know why. <laughs> EOD guys, do you guys sing songs? I think our drink is just alcohol. Period. <laughs> <laughs> you cut off right there. Do you guys sing songs? Not really, no. No, no. no. Oh, we've never had a song like the, so like the army has the ordnance corps song, but it's really hokey. So we've never like right, no one right. no one in EOD knows the ordnance corps song. But I'm talking about you're you're in the bar together doing your thing, and there's do you have a you don't have EOD songs like fighter pilots have fighter pilot songs, and they're all based off like rugby songs. So if you ever heard any of the kind of standard rugby songs that we have versions of that, you guys do anything like that? No, not really. No, you just, you just pickle back until you can't see and we just just drink drinking like every year we have over in over in uh for Walton Beach we have the EOD memorial and every year it's 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 kind of like an Irish wake so like we have the memorial ceremony is on a Saturday morning and then you have uh, out at the Emerald Coast Convention Center you have the night before you have the auction the EOD auction which is the memorial auction and so you have all of these items that are made and donated by either former techs or companies that are made out of just typically EOD related stuff. And they'll go there and auction it off to, you'll have gold star families there. You'll have 
right. retired sergeant majors and everything. And that's typically the place where everybody comes out and just goes nuts. We used to have, uh, actually we do sing, but we don't have our own stuff. So like there used to be that piano bar uh, across the street from there, but it closed. So it yes, used to be. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about in Destin, right? Yeah, yeah it used to be called Howl at the Moon. Yes, yes, exactly right. Howl at the Moon, been there, yeah. Yeah, it, it closed. It's a taco place now. <laughs> oh, okay. no, and so they closed. It used to be like you finish out at the auction or the ball, and then you go over there, and everybody'd be be in there singing Bohemian Rhapsody drunk or something yeah, to yeah. a piano player. <laughs> are there any what are, are there any EOD traditions that you can share? Uh, I mean, we always have the grog at the ball, so you have the everybody has. But I think that's not necessarily just an EOD tradition. Yeah, EOD that's... guys are very superstitious. Um, our tradition is you always have to have an EOD coin with you. Um, so like EOD revolves around owing beer. You always owe beer. Yeah, anytime you do something for the first time that's EOD related, you owe beer. And it's typically you owe a case of the beer, you owe a case of beer to the shop. And the shop is, you know, everybody you work with. Right. And so it's, it's gone away a little bit as like when I first joined EOD, we still had, uh, we were still allowed to have shop bars. So like you'd finish up for the day, everybody's right. done. You go into the fridge, there's beer, everybody grabs a beer and you play pool. But that kind of has gone away with a little bit of the younger generation. And as the army changed, we had to take beer out of the shops because people would be getting, you know, sloppy in the middle of the day. Right. Or it, it just, it didn't look good, especially as EOD got more uh, notoriety on it. Like the beginning of the war, nobody knew who, who EOD was. And it wasn't until like the insurgency kicked up that everyone's like, oh, EOD. Um, but so the rule is you always have to have a coin on you somewhere. If your coin is with outside arm's reach, if somebody drops a coin on the table, so like, here's one of my coins right here. Yep. Actually, it's in plastic. Um, if somebody drops a coin uh, and you don't have one, you owe beer. If everybody else around you has one, you owe everybody beer. Um, if your name ends up in the news, your name or your photo identifiable ends up in the news somewhere, you owe beer to the first person that calls you out on it. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. We have the same thing. It's called coining. So if you... You drop a coin, like you said. If if everyone has one, you you buy. If uh, if someone doesn't have one, they buy. So that, that's that's the same thing. That's fantastic. Let me t so, how much did EOD change in the last fifteen odd years of war? Like you were you were in there. You just got started when we invaded, and then we just we had this long drawn out thing still going on in Iraq. Syria, Afghanistan, you guys have been busy to say the least, right? You're a low density, high demand kind of career field, mm -hmm. but how much, how much more professional, skilled, capable would you say EOD is from, you know, 2003 when the invasion started till today? I mean, our guys have always been like, even, even the older guys, like we always had a huge, dearth of knowledge like everybody's always had the massive 50 pound brains that some of the guys have but it's just didn't have as much uh experience hands-on experience yeah. with it yeah. so as the it's gone on but it, everybody has different experiences depending on where and how they're deploying well I've, I've, I've had four deployments now and everyone has been almost completely different from the one before it so it's it's always been kind of a challenge for the career field to set a <clears> um like this is what we are now and so our skill set has evolved so much over the last 15 years that we look completely different than we did during yeah. the initial invasion of Iraq. So like our guys, initial invasion of Iraq, we're rolling into Iraq in soft side Viad Humvees um, with their DCUs and their, I think some still had M16s. And it was kind of like, all right, well, we've got this thing to blow up. And so they were, they were basically just getting rid of ammo caches at the time or clearing mines, whatever they had to do. But it was like, all right, we're going to set our demo. We're going to go back behind the truck and that's that's it we didn't have a lot of robots like we had bomb suits but it was it wasn't so much it was like hands-on you're putting down or TN, tnt or c4 on stuff and that's you know that's the day you're rigging up all these ammo caches to go away and then as it moved into the insurgency we had to you know we switched vehicles we started using more robots we had to use more standoff techniques and from what we are now now we're focused mostly on uh, soft support missions and uh, things like that where we have to be sm lighter and smaller and lower density in that aspect. So working in smaller teams. And it's it's kind of gone a number of different directions to the point yeah. where we have multiple skill sets within the career field now that are really only unique to themselves 
because if you do a different one, that's going to teach you something counterintuitive to the other one. Right. So, so it's definitely grown. I mean, I know the JTAC career field has done the same thing, especially the guys who are connected and attached to the soft is going from the, the big, you know, brigade aspect and now becoming that much lighter, leaner capability with all his gear and his hardened laptop and his laser rangefinder and everything and being able to do all that. Um, so yeah, that's, it's crazy how a lot of that stuff has, has definitely changed. All right, tell everybody, get, give us your best explosion story, man. What's the best explosion you ever ca you ever caused? Um, the coolest one. This, there's been a couple of really cool ones. We had my most of my cool ones came from my first deployment in 2009, 2010. Uh, one of the really fun ones we did was in the middle of the night. We had this um, we had this human resource that came to us. Uh, the human guys came and they're like, hey, we've got this cache, uh, this this Taliban cache that's right outside the fence here that we're going to go take care of. we got the source that's going to show us. Will you, you know, come with us so we can get rid of it? And so I was, I went out as like a guest team member with an, with a uh, Air Force team, which the Air Force teams I'm always jealous of because they have way better equipment than the Army teams. <laughs> it's like they, they, the Air Force doesn't have too many ground pounders out there, but when they are out there, like they have just the most primo gear. <laughs> and so I go out with his Air Force team, and it's me and them. Uh, the team leader's name was Rory. I was still a team member at the time. And they walk us out here, and he's like, hey, it's right here. And we're like, all right, man, here's a shovel to start digging. Like, we're not, we're not digging this up for you. And so this guy starts digging this up, and he finds it, and it's this cache of Russian 122-millimeter white phosphorus rounds. And so it's like 10 or 12 of them. And so it's like, all right, that's a lot. That's a lot of white phosphorus we've got to get rid of. So when you get rid of white phosphorus, it's not like typical explosives where you put the explosive on top and blow it down because the white phosphorus won't burn. You have to give it space to burn off. So what you have to do is you put the explosive underneath the round and you actually blow it up into the sky. You crack it and it throws the white phosphorus out everywhere to let it burn. How far away and do you have so, to be? Uh, depends on the amount of white phosphorus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... I walk back and Roy's like, Hey man, go get the explosives. Like we, we need enough for all of these. So we, I walk back and as I'm walking back, I'm coming up out of this trench, which we thought it was kind of weird. We're walking by all of these, these trenches in the ground. I'm like what's with all these trenches. And as I'm walking back, there's this line of rocks and it's white on one side and red on the other side. Anybody who's ever been in one of these less civilized countries knows that that means we were in a minefield. Dope. <laughs> so uh, we were on the wrong side of the mine line. And so I walked to the truck and I was So how much had you walked around through the minefield already? Uh, we walked around about 30 minutes in this thing. Oh, shit. <laughs> but, I mean, we were watching where we were walking. It was just kind of like one of those, like, it was it was right outside Bagram Air Base. So I, I suspect most of the mines had been cleared by that point. All right. But there were still a few out there. We did find <laughs> a few after that. So we went walking. I got the explosive walk back and it's looking like, yeah, hey, man, we're we're, we're in a minefield right now. And uh, the, the human uh, worker, the resource person, uh, starts kind of panicking, like, oh, my God, we're in a minefield. We're going to die. We're in a minefield. Just, just stop. Like, you know where you've already stepped. Just don't step anywhere else. Step down in the hole. It's fine. <laughs> and so we finish up setting this thing, go back to the truck, and we set this off. And the cool thing, I mean, did you ever drop white phosphorus in your end? No. no. I mean, well, white phosphorus, if you ever see it at night, it's cool. It's a big, big fireball. It looks like it looks like Hollywood shots. They're they're great. And so we set these this shot off with all this white phosphorus, and they fly everywhere. Um, but the thing is, it doesn't destroy the round when you set it off. So these flaming 122 millimeter rounds are just clumping down all over from where we were. <laughs> and uh, so we're walking by, and I see this 122 with just this jet of flame screaming out the front of it from all the white phosphorus burning. And uh, the A and A didn't know we were doing the shot, so they come screaming out the gate like, <laughs> "There's a big explosion!" We've been attacked, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was that was probably my favorite shot. Um, yeah. Just just from how wild it was, and the fact that it looked really really cool. Just a crowd uh, pleaser because of all the, the everything going on at once all over the place. Oh yeah, for me it was it was great. It's one of those ones I'll always remember. Um, we had another big one that was like a couple thousand pounds that we did out at uh, at the base I was at, and we had to get rid of some stuff. But it wasn't. It was just. It was. I like doing big shots, but the problem is there are a lot of work to set up. Yeah. You have to unpack everything. You have to set the explosives. You have to set all the all the caps and everything. Get everybody out of the way. Make sure everything. Because if you do sloppy demo, you end up just throwing stuff, 
and then you have to go find it and that's a pain in the butt oh right yeah you don't want to just toss it somewhere else it's got yeah. it's got to die in the fire with the rest of them right yes <laughs> yeah the, only, the thing the only thing i've been close to is we were out in the range with the a10s and they were dropping some 500 pound things and we weren't too close I mean, obviously we we're safely far away where we we're supposed to be but even so the, the sh it was out in the desert at gila bend so mm -hmm. the shock wave i just i'll never forget that you see that thing and coming at you and then you feel that chest thump that little you thump know, yeah that yeah. whole like your whole soul has been rattled in your i mean i'm not telling you anything there but that that was uh that got your that got your attention man you, you knew yeah. instinctively that you did not want to be any closer oh yeah no i made i made that mistake in uh in 2012 uh, had a small charge that we found, like a small ID I was getting rid of. But when you when you deal with explosive waves, you you have to realize that they bounce and they channelize. And we were in between these two. We we're in this long collot, um, we had two big collot walls on either side of this little wadi. And we found the IED on one side of the wadi, so I cleaned What's it up. What's a collot? Uh, collot is the uh, it's it's like a little compound. Okay. Basically, mud, mud brick wall two compound. Two walls, so basically. In, yeah. And so then you have the wadi, which is the ditch with all the water or the irrigation ditch. So it's basically like brick walls or mud brick walls on either side. Areas probably 20 feet wide with a little with a ditch in the middle. And I uh, found an IED in one spot. So I was like, all right, cool. So I set it up to go away. And then I walked probably 20, 30 meters down the down the wadi or down the down the way. And uh, I didn't in my head. I was like, all right, this should be OK. It was probably maybe 10 pounds overall. And what I didn't take into account, the walls channeling the explosive wave at me. So what mm. happened was, is I almost knocked me and my two guys out for a second because it was just like, oh, what just happened? And it's, it's, we didn't, we weren't in danger of like dying from getting fragged or anything, but it was just one of those, like, we didn't take into account the, the bouncing overpressure that would hit us. That's one of those things where you, you immediately realize your mistake, but it's too late because it just happened. Oh, yeah. No, we had video of it. And then immediately on the video, I looked at my guys. I was like, hey, remember when the school, they taught us that thing about reflective blast waves? And my one guy being a smart ass was like, I don't know what you're talking about right now. <laughs> that stuff's fake. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. Can you can you give your – obviously, you can kill yourself from the from the shock wave or overpressure or whatever. Can you, can you also get concussed? Yes. Short, short of um, getting dead, I mean, it, can it just like rattle the brain? Yeah, you can you can give yourself full on TBIs just from like not even getting hit in the vehicle, just being like too close to too it. Too close, yeah. And that's that's something that's starting to be more prevalent as they're doing more TBI testing and stuff. EOD guys are obviously kind of a focus group for that, and so the not only they're discussing like single single point incidents, but just like your prolonged exposure to maybe yeah a less less intense. Yeah, and that's something that, that we're starting to get a better understanding of, and I think a lot of EOD guys are suffering from that. E even me, like I, my memory, I'm I'm only 34, my memory, my short term memory is absolutely terrible. Uh, so you'll yeah. you'll notice those those small like less than less than traumatic blasts will start to add up over time. Yeah, we we have a, a similar thing in fighter aviation, but it's with the radars. So no, very powerful yourself. radar, yeah. So the <laughs> cancer issues and things, and they're only now starting to look into that. And I think there's a lot of examples like that in the military where you have these these dangerous jobs. Uh, you know, the easy one are the the jumpers and the knees and backs. I mean, they've known that for a long time, but that oh, kind yeah. of repeated stuff takes a toll on you when you're in the military. Do G's for us, ex you know, explosions, TBI for you guys. No, I, spent, I spent my first three years in Airborne. I know all about my knees. There you go. There you go. And we had a lot of JTACs that were jumpers, and every one of them had bad knees or hips or back or whatever. Yeah, my my knees sound like uh, <clears throat> my knees sound like Rice Krispies now. <laughs> yep, crack my wife crackle will, pop. I, yeah, I knelt down last night next to my wife while she was streaming, and both my knees popped at the same time, and it was so loud the stream heard it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's not, it's just not something they tell us when we get started, is it? There's no there's no information on that. It's just no, how cool no. jumping is. This is going to be awesome. You're going to jump out of an airplane. All right, let's do this thing. Yeah, let's go. It's yeah. great. Ow, that kind of hurt my knee. 10, 15, 20, 100 times later. That really hurts my knee. <laughs> yeah, no, my my first time, my, my squad leader rigged my my stuff up so tight that I couldn't actually release my rifle uh, mm. from its, from its uh, locked on my side. 
and so I ended up landing on it, which it wasn't a rifle, it was a saw, it was a, a 2.9, and I landed on, it was on my left side, and I landed on it, and I thought I had broke my leg at first, because I couldn't, I couldn't feel anything, so I couldn't get it off my side. Yeah. Did you just lay yeah. there till someone come help you? Uh, it took a minute. Uh, it, well, nobody would have come to find me, because it was, I was on the biggest drop zone on Fort Bragg, and it was the middle of the night. All right, so... <laughs> I was like, if I didn't get up and get moving, I was like, all right, I got to try and limp my way back to the freaking parachute collection point and then maybe get looked at. Going to have to help yourself at that point. Yeah. Well, hey, man, anything else? I uh, appreciate you coming by. I do. Anything else you want to tell everybody? Getting back to, to tanks and gaming and all that stuff, a little lighter subject. You know, any other? I always give people uh, their, the last thing I ask when I do the, the interviews is, is Jimmy's advice for life, whether it has to do with tanks or life or whatever. What do you want? What? Give me your best piece of advice. Uh, do the thing. Well, I mean, it's it's going to be really simple. I mean, do, do the things that make you happy. If you like gaming, do do gaming. If you, if that's uh, God, that's such a broad. It is. I'm like trying to narrow it down. What's my advice for life? I'll just I'll just stick with gaming. My advice for gaming is play play the games that you enjoy, not necessarily the ones that you feel that you have to. Like don't. Don't keep playing, and this applies to World of Tanks. Don't keep playing a game because you're like, I've already spent this much time. Because you know, if I stop now, then what? What was it all for? Well, I mean, even if you keep playing, what was it all for? Like, do what you <laughs> enjoy. So, except, except that the time that you're playing video games is only good for your mental health and nothing else. And just, just kind of focus on that mental health because you're, you're going to hit a point where, like. E you are going to depend on your mental health more than you would like to. And if you, there are cracks in it or if you haven't spent any time trying to be healthy, you're, you're going to be sitting there wondering what you're doing. And you don't want to be in that dark place. That's, so, that's great, do, man. Do I, like you have it. I like that. I especially like the, the uh, don't keep going just because you might think, what the hell was it all for? Because if you keep going, you might think, what the hell is it all for? <laughs> Yeah, that is completely valid, man. I like this it. Is the sunken cost fallacy. It's it's gone either way. Yeah, that's that is completely valid. That time is that time is gone. So you might as well keep on moving on. Hey, Jimmy, thanks for coming by. I do appreciate it. Uh, that was a, that was a great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Good luck with uh, you know the future. What you're doing with the YouTube or whatever. Is there anything I can do to help? I don't know what it would be, but if there is, just let me know. Uh, hopefully, we can. Uh, hook up later to do some streaming or something along the way, but thank you very much. I'll let you know when this thing is coming out and that is everything I've got. We'll see you guys later. Jimmy say goodbye to the people. No, take it easy. Everyone have a great day.